need your help. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And anyone who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. The question is, what did Jesus mean by renouncing all that he has? What does it mean to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him? Does it mean you renounce and give up all your time, your money, your possessions? Or is it more than that? It means letting go of all that this world has to offer and clinging tightly to Jesus Christ, even if that means losing your life. So why in the world would anyone follow Jesus then? Why would you give up all that you have to follow someone else? And Who would do such a thing? It doesn't appear from the earth's standpoint to be like fun and enjoyable. Yet this is exactly what Jesus calls us to do. Forsake all that the world has to offer. Deny yourself. Come and follow him. For those in here who have said yes to Jesus and no to the world, we wrestle with this calling every single day. How do we renounce all as we live in one of the wealthiest countries in the world? Majority of us, if not all of us, have all that we need, if not more. But this morning we're going to learn what it means to forsake all that we have and live a cross-centered life. So before we begin, let's pray again. Father, I need your help to communicate your words, and I pray that you will use whatever feeble efforts I've put into this message and through wrestling with your word to proclaim it to the people, to the listeners, so that it will affect our hearts and our affections for you and transform us in a way that we live and think differently because of Jesus Christ. I am desperately in need of your help, as in everyone else in this room, and is desperately in need of your help to understand, apply, and grow, and learn. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We'll be moving through the second half of chapter 2, 12 and 30, like I said earlier. To review, Paul had exhorted the Philippian church to live as citizens of heaven. He wrote that citizens of heaven stand firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. In addition, citizens of heaven are not selfish, and they do not try to impress others. They are humble and count others more significant than themselves. That's a pretty high calling. Yet, we see pictures of this in our society. I see it in sports teams. They stand firm, they work together, they give of themselves, and they're striving for one goal. But we also see it with the armed forces, men and women working diligently and at times painfully to learn to live and die together for the sake of others. In fact, I think that is the closest example of what Paul was asking the church in Philippi to be. But church is different. At least in the armed forces, you have some idea what you're getting yourself into and the choice you make to enter into. But for most of us, I don't think we were sure what we were getting ourselves into when we committed our life to Christ. Jesus said, count the cost. Did we really? Many of us have not chosen the people in this room to be our partnership in the gospel. And we may not have. Given our own devices, we would have chosen people we got along with, our friends, same interests, and same desires. But God chose each and every one of you to live together in this place at this time as citizens of heaven for his glory. Therefore, it's going to take something supernatural in order for us to work as a church and as a people with a unified purpose in a self-sacrificing way. It just doesn't come naturally to us. So how does one live this way? Paul helps us in this letter, and as we learn, it is a life that is gripped by the gospel. So look at me at verse 12. 
It starts with therefore. In other words, and I see therefore, I think, for this reason. This prompts us to look back to the previous verses in 5 through 11. It would do us well to commit verses 5 through 11 to memory. Let's read them together. Well, I'll read them out loud. You can listen. Follow along. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is one of the greatest pieces ever written about Jesus. It is packed theologically with so much to comprehend and ponder and to think about. And countless pieces have been written in exegeting this passage. But it also sets forth an example, or as Paul says, a mindset that will really take a lifetime to fully comprehend. There is no comparison to what Jesus did. It leaves us no excuse why we can't serve and love others. And having this mindset is the only way we can live that cross-centered kind of life. Without this mindset, we can't really obey out of grace. We cannot take up our cross and follow him. We may be able to follow the rules, right? We may be able to do some of these things and tithe and follow these rituals, but that is law and not grace. When we take time to meditate on these verses, our hearts will be gripped, we will, and then we will live out what we believe, and we will be citizens of heaven. But it will not be easy. We are all born Adams, Eves, right? Born and bred to live, exalting in and for ourselves and for our own glory. So it's going to take work. So let's pick up in verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The meat of this sentence is the following. Therefore, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Paul's ex exhortation to obey is working out their salvation. Obedience takes work. But this obedience, again, is not for salvation, but out of salvation. Because they are saved, they will work out their salvation in practical living. Hence, Paul knows that following Christ is not a simple set of rules and regulations, but rather it is much more than that. It is working out what it means to renounce all that he has and take up your cross and follow Jesus. This is another reason why Paul prayed in chapter 1, if you look back, that this is what he prayed, that their love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent. In other words, so that they will know how to live life together as the citizens of heaven in this fallen world. It takes work in prayer and it takes work with each other. Remember, this letter <clears throat> was to the saints and overseers and deacons. It was to be done in community. When the elders meet to discuss finances or church challenges, we are working out our salvation. When you attend worship, ABE classes, flock, or involved in other ministries, you are working out your salvation. When we fellowship with one another, seek wise counsel from each other, serve one another alongside in various ministries, we are working out this salvation. It is a team sport and is not done in isolation. <clears throat> but 
But notice at the beginning of this verse, Paul exhorts them to continue to obey, not only like they did when he was there, but it seems even more important that they do it while he is not there. There is an old proverb that says, when the cat is away, the mouse will play. Meaning authority, when authority is away, people will do as they please. Now, this church is not disobedient because Paul is not there. Remember, it says, obey as I was, before, as you have in the past. But Paul knows God is already working in them. He has seen it in their gifts to him, in their prayers for him, and in sending one of their own who risked his life for him. But he, ex- but he exhorts them to do it with fear and trembling. So why? This fear and trembling is not to be the motivator, right? It's not obey or the wrath of God will come down on you. Let's be clear. We have to remind ourselves that Christ bore the wrath of God for our sin, that we would be free to obey. Rather, this refers to a sober attitude that results from recognizing both our inadequacy in of ourselves and the life or death significance of the situation in which we find ourselves. We don't obey out of fear of God, but rather we recognize that the only way we can live like citizens of heaven is by our complete and utter dependence upon the power of God, the Holy Spirit that's within us. It is only by the grace of God we obey to begin with. But it's in fact that both our willing and our doing lie beyond our own resources and that can be found only in God's working that makes this whole project a matter of fear and trembling. So why are you here this morning? Most of us made a deliberate effort to prepare ourselves to come here this morning, or you're listening from a different location. Some of you came with great enthusiasm and excitement. Others, not so much. Some of you had to be dragging out of, drug out of bed to get here. Either way, you're here both because either you made an effort and because God is at work in you. We want to take credit for the things we do, and yet God is working in you. There may be times in our walk with Christ when you feel like giving up. There may be times when you wonder why you keep going and is it really worth it? You become consumed with doubt. But you find yourself continuing to show up, continuing to go, maybe sporadically, but you keep showing up. Why? Because Christ is in you. He is working in you at all times. Praise God that it isn't dependent upon us. It's dependent upon him. And he is trustworthy and true. And he is worth all that you want to give to him. He will keep his promises to the very end. That's what we depend on every day of our single life is the promises of God. He is our salvation. This is the fight of faith, and we need each other to come alongside each other, remind ourselves we're not alone, and we need each other, and we need the word of God, that he is working among us. Those who think or have the mind of Christ, they trust God in their efforts for obedience. Right? Listen, God has saved you. Mark prayed this earlier and mentioned earlier. God has saved you, is saving you, and he will save you and take you to the very end. Rejoice in that. This leads us to verse 14 with all that good news that God is working in us. Look at verse 14. Then do all things without grumbling or disputing. The mighty power of God is present in every believer through the Holy Spirit, and he is working within you, as I continue to repeat myself here. So do everything without grumbling or disputing or arguing. That is a command. It's easy to tell our children to memorize this verse, right? We told our children, obey right away, without delay, all the way, with a happy attitude. And then I looked in the mirror and was complaining about how hard it was to raise my kids. I wasn't emulating the exact attitude that I wanted my kids to have. So why would I ask them to do something I couldn't do because I was doing it all in my own power? I expect them, that takes the power of God to do, to do it in their own power, and they were failing. 
This is what God is asking us to do and calling the Philippians to do. And this is why we need the attitude of Christ. Think of this. If God is working all things together, if he is orchestrating all the situations and events in our lives for our good and his glory, then why would we complain or argue with others? It's because we don't believe God and we don't believe his word. But citizens of heaven work this out with one another, right? This is a daily battle between the spirit and the flesh. It is only overcome by rehearsing the gospel to ourselves and keeping a heavenly perspective. It comes from sacrificing our own personal desires and agendas in order to prefer others. And there is great joy that is received from sacrifice. This is what the Son of God did. This is how the children of God should respond. The obedience that results from God's working, His rescue, deep within our hearts, will show in an extraordinary reaction to the pressures of a dominant and unsympathetic cultural establishment. Instead of accommodation, retaliation, isolation, and internal conflict, listen, Jesus' followers will engage one another and their non-Christian neighbors with patient and selfless contentment, neither grumbling and self-pity nor questioning God's purpose for the situation and circumstances that you're in. You see, in every situation and trial, we need to remember the examples that God has given us in his word. Remember Deuteronomy 8, 2 through 6? You don't have to turn there, but. As Moses prepares the Israelites before entering the promised land, he reminds them, it was God who led them into the wilderness. That he might humble them, testing them to know what was in their heart, whether they would keep his commandments or not. And as he did humble them, he let them hunger, and he, but he fed them manna so that they would know that man does not live by bread alone, but every word of God that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Moses reminds them that their clothing did not wear out, their feet didn't swell, and he wants them to see God's kindness and care for them in the wilderness, in the struggle. And then he says, Know then in your heart that as man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So you keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his way and by fearing him. And why are we to do this? For the gospel, not only in the present, but also for the future of Christ's return. So read with me from verse 14 on. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. Be who you are, right? Paul says we are to be different than the world. Once again, he refers back to his beginning prayer in chapter 1. Amazing how those two connect here. In verse 9 of chapter 1, he says, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Again, reminding us we need prayer for this. This was his prayer, and it was his exhortation. Be different than the world. Be blameless and innocent. Be children of God. Only a child of God will have the mind of God. And only the child of God will think like his father. And only a child God will emulate the one he spends in his efforts pursuing. Be it Christ. The wilderness generation grumbled against Moses and against the Lord himself. Moses soberly described those Israelites, listen, and no longer his children because they are blemished. They are crooked and twisted generation. Don't be Israelites, right? Look at the one Israelite and believe upon him and trust in him. The world is crooked and, and, crooked and twisted. Don't be surprised at that. And don't be surprised how you look to the world. You should look different and be treated differently because your citizenship is in heaven. And once again, Paul tells us this is done by holding fast to God's word and remembering what he has done for you. Remembering his care and kindness towards you as you walk in this wilderness of life. 
longing for the day that you enter an eternal rest on the day of Christ. We should be longing for that return. Remember that you are a son or a daughter of the living God. And he loves you. He loves you so much that he is willing to train you and take you through difficulty and prepare you to be like his son. And remember what awaits us there. In this way, you will shine as lights in the world and keep your eyes on the light of the world, and keep your eyes on the light of the world, Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. What for the joy set before him endured the cross. Brothers and sisters, there is joy set before us. So let us obey in a believing way. To end this section, there are three examples I want to look at. Paul already gave us the one perfect example in verses 5 through 11. Now we're going to read three others. We're going to see what it looks like to take up your cross and carry it for the sake of Christ, to renounce all. Pick up in the second half of verse 16. A submissive servant. This is Paul speaking. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul is following Christ's example as he's willing to pour out his own life for the sake of their faith. Paul's metaphor of being poured out as a drink offering is an allusion to an Old Testament scene. As one writer describes, in the ancient sanctuary, the daily morning and evening burnt offerings were accompanied by drink offerings. Before the fire was to incinerate the slain lamb that's laid before them, the priest would pour out the wine over the victim to enhance the pleasing aroma to the Lord. Although the, both lamb and wine were consumed in consecration to the Lord, the lamb itself was central. This is Paul's point when he now speaks of being poured out on the sacrificial offering of your faith. He was only enhancing the Philippians' faith. He was not the central figure. He wasn't saying, look at what I'm doing. Look at what, how much I'm sacrificing. Yeah, he said, look at myself to be an example. But the point is, it's your faith, your growth that matters to me most. I'm willing to pour myself out for that. He, Paul rejoices in sacrificing for this church, and he wants the Philippian church to rejoice with him. This is because it's all of God's work. The prospect of seeing people living their lives for God's glory, whatever the cost, turns serious suffering into sheer celebration. I am glad and rejoice with you all, he says. Here again, in the context of suffering and the prospect of impending death, the apostle sounds the reoccurring note of joy that runs like a golden thread through the tapestry of this whole epistle. He is a submissive servant to the Lord Jesus Christ and thence to the Philippians. Now we read of a selfless servant. Look at me at verses 19 to 24. And I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. They all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me, and I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. This begins and ends this section, I hope in the Lord Jesus, and I trust in the Lord. Paul is wholly dependent upon him, upon the Lord, in making these decisions. Paul wants to send Timothy. He says, I have no one like him. There's no one better to send to you. He's the best I've got. And what sets Timothy apart from all others? He is genuinely concerned for their welfare. And the word genuinely here is, is attributed to like worry. Like in the Philippians 4, it says, do not worry. Why do they make this genuinely concerned? It's probably because you're not supposed to worry. We don't look, make them look like they did. But essentially, that's it. He's worried about their spiritual welfare. And he says, others seek their own interests. 
There's probably others who go, hey, Paul, I'll go. This is my opportunity to take this church over and make it what it should be because I've got all these ideas. Not Timothy. He has proven himself time after time after time. He has their spiritual well-being as his drive and not their physical well-being. Timothy has the mind of Christ. He, too, took the form of a servant to serve Jesus by serving Paul and the Philippians. In humility, he counts others more significant than himself. He is a proven Christ follower. And we have read about the submissive servant, the selfless servant, and now we'll read about the suffering servant. So let's pick up in verse 25. I have thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, working his, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. This letter Paul has written was delivered by Epaphroditus. Why Paul considers Timothy a son, which does not or should not cause us to think any less of Timothy, which is also a side note to thinking that that illusion of a father serving the son was of great value and high honor back then. What is it like today? Do we say that? wonder where our society has gone. That's my soapbox. I'll stop getting off on those things. He is a brother. Notice the descriptors he uses, my brother. So he is a brother and equal to Paul. He is a fellow worker operating on the same power of grace as Paul. And he is a fellow soldier fighting the same fight of faith as Paul. And he also put his life on the line for the work of Christ. Epaphroditus is the messenger and minister from the Philippians, for he is one of their own, sent to Paul's need. Epaphroditus risked his life for the gospel. Notice, too, how he reacted when the Philippians knew of his illness. Look, it says he was distressed. Why? So he wouldn't worry about it. He didn't want to bring attention to himself. I don't want them worrying about me while I'm suffering and serving them, serving Christ. Men and women who have the mind of Christ take no thought for their lives when serving for the gospel. Now, I am not advocating we all go out and devise ways to deliberately risk your life for the gospel as if that is to be worthy. We make up these ways to feel like we are giving our life for Jesus. Or am I encouraging you to go out and make yourself so busy with the gospel and serving the church that you're dying inside? But what I am advocating is to, advocating is to work our is to be gripped by the gospel so much so that your decisions you make in serving have a heavenly mindset and motivation. You will find great joy in renouncing everything for the gospel serving others if your motivation is out of love for Christ and him alone. These were the men that were doing the work. They were serving sacrificially and they were not grumbling or disputing among themselves. So let's wrap up. I just have a brief, brief reflect and respond. I began this message with Jesus teaching on the cost of discipleship. And this is where I end it. John chapter 12, 25 and 26 says, Those who love their... I love this. This, this, this hits right we're talking about serving here. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Listen, anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. We serve Jesus Christ first and then we serve each other. Following Jesus is costly 
It may cost our time. It may cost our money. It may cost our possessions. Wear and tear in our homes. But more importantly, it may cost us our lives. Remember, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. By reflecting on Jesus and the gospel, our great salvation in Christ, we will be willing to lay down our, love or our, our lives for others with great joy. Because we know that Jesus is the one great pearl worth selling all that we have to follow him. Let's be gripped by the gospel. Let's pray. Father, it is only by the power of your spirit that we can be gripped in that way. You are working in us, and may we be a people that pursues you with affections and our efforts and all that we do and say and all that we read and every way we live, that we will be poured out for Christ and be reflected here in this church so that we shine as lights into the dark world. It's all by your name, great name, we do this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.